So thank you so much for having me. It's really exciting to be here. Um, so there's, uh, as usual with neonatal absence syndrome, there's not much to uh, disclose. There's no, this isn't a real big money-making operation here. So, uh, so uh, I'm going to just talk very briefly. The opioid stuff in the United States, as we all know, you guys are, are in the middle of this. You know, this is a big problem. Most of the data I have from this is from Stephen anyway, so you can, you can, you can hit that when you when you get it, but this is, the major thing is this is a big problem, and a lot of this has been driven uh, somewhat by the medical community, prescriptions going up fourfold. Um, and what one that I did not get from Stephen, in our state in Connecticut, the leading cause of accidental deaths forever have been is car accidents, and the rate of car accidents has stayed pretty stable. It's gone up a little bit uh, over the last few years by a couple percentage points. There's three times as many opioid deaths as there are car accident deaths in Connecticut now. So. You, the opioid problem is enormous in this area and also in the, we're, we, I think we really started in the Northeast where Purdue Farm is a Connecticut company, so we're, uh, we were on the front lines of this problem. Um, and there was, in 2012, there were enough prescription, opioid prescriptions for every person to get one. So if you didn't get one, then somebody else got yours. Of course, we see this opioid problem the most in pediatrics is with neonatal absence syndrome. This is probably stolen right from Stephen, uh, and it's gone up like this, and this is what we've seen in our state as well and in our hospital. I am a pediatric hospitalist. This is a study from, from a number of years ago that said about 4 or 5% of NICU beds were full of NAS babies, and in community hospitals it was as high as 50%, which is certainly what we see in our state. Uh, in the, the community hospitals in our health system, it's 40 or 50% of their beds are, are in neonatal absence syndrome. So what happens to the baby? And so, so babies, when moms mostly, uh, certainly where, where I am, are on, uh, are, we have a bunch of methadone clinics right around the hospital, so we're mostly methadone, more buprenorphine now. But the moms are getting some sort of regular opioid, and so is the, 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 uh, the fetus is getting that as well. And so in order to keep some level of homeostasis, what they'll do, there'll be an upregulation of receptors, uh, mostly in the area of the brain called the locus ceruleus. And then when the baby's born, that source of opioids stops, and then there's this surge of norepinephrine, which seems to coincide with the signs of withdrawal, which we've all seen, and the signs of withdrawal are similar to what you'll see in adults. And so the baby goes through that, and you can see they're, they're somewhat similar, and has anyone, anyone recognized this? Yes, okay, yeah, so this does a pretty good job. This is the Finnegan tool, if there's anyone who's living under a rock the last few years. Um, and this does a nice job of describing all the signs of withdrawal. How many people have actually used this to score? Many, yeah, so, so you know it's broken up in these areas, and it really does a, a good job of collecting all of the signs of withdrawal that you can get. And this was developed in the mid-1970s when there was a uh, opioid, a heroin epidemic in Philadelphia, and they were seeing lots and lots of these babies. And, and Dr. Finnegan was sort of being inundated with these and was trying to find a way to standardize the care a little bit. And with really good observation, her team came up with these things, because this is, this is really an exhaustive level uh, of detail, uh, collecting really all the signs of withdrawal, and put us a, a score next to each one, which was somewhat arbitrary, but sort of made sense if it seemed worse, it got a higher score. So things like having markedly hyperactive moro got a three, uh, not being able to sleep got a three. If you had severe tremors when disturbed, that got a three, but things like uh, nasal stuffiness only got a one, uh, sneezing got a one, things like that. So it was, it was, it sort of uh, goes with how you would think it would go if people, you had to make it up. And of course, uh, you you would add up the scores, and the magic number is eight. Right? Yes. All right. So it's eight, and eight was what they used to to start um, medication therapy, and um, and that's sort of what's been done pretty consistently. What we were doing at Yale, and what I'm going to do, I'm going to tell you about this eat, sleep, console approach, but I'm going to tell you a story of how we came to it and came around to it. It wasn't something that we just one day said, let's study this new approach, but we sort of developed it over time. And the, the standard approach, which you guys do some version of, includes the first line treatment is non-pharmacologic care, use the Finnegan tool um, to determine whether you need medication, and once you hit your threshold, which is usually 
Most places is three scores of eight. Some places also two scores of 12. Some places will do two scores of eight. I think you guys do some, some version of that. Then that triggers the use of medication, uh, which then gets weaned slowly over time. And that's kind of the standard approach. And a lot of the studies uh, over time have been trying to figure out what the right medication to use is or the right combination of medications are used. And that's sort of, that's where, that's where, um, that's where probably from 10 years ago and, and forward, it was a lot trying to figure that out. And at Yale, we had the benefit of going through most of these medications. So the first one we went through was this one, which is paragoric. Uh, so you would only remember this if you've been around a while. This doesn't look like something you should give to a baby, and that's probably true. Um, so it's got uh, it's a tincture of opium, and if it's a tincture of something, it's 30% alcohol. But they also add other carcinogenics in it. So I'm not sure why this was the choice initially, but it was. And so um, that got moved to just tincture of opium after a while. And you can't quite see in the bottom, but it lists, lists a study on the bottom which compares uh, tincture of opium um, versus um, morphine and finds basically the length of stay was similar. And, and the outcomes for most of these studies are trying, are, are trying to figure out whether there's a, a difference in the length of treatment uh, with the medication or, or in length of stay. And so this one found basically no difference. So, uh, and that's what we were using initially. We, we moved to tincture of opium and then in the 90s we made the decision to move to morphine and we made that decision because our pharmacy stopped carrying tincture of opium. So that was an easy decision for us. And uh, what the American Academy of Pediatrics says is that you should use a like medication. So if you're withdrawing from an opioid, you should give back an opioid. Some places will use phenobarbital, uh, and this was a study comparing uh, phenobarbital uh, with uh, tincture of opium and found that actually it was a shorter length of stay when you used tincture of opium. Uh, and so that's where we were. Now there were a lot of places using phenobarbital as a second line Medication. So if you kind of max out on your dose of whatever you're using, you give phenobarbital, anyone do that? Yes, familiar with that? Yeah, so we, we've done that. And this is actually uh, a study done at Brown. Uh, and, and what they did is they gave half the kids tincture of opium and half the kids, right from the start, tincture of opium and phenobarbital. And they found that the kids who got the phenobarbital group had half the length of stay of the other group which is a really dramatic, dramatic result. In fact, if you look at the Cochrane Review that came out of that time, has anyone read a Cochrane Review? They do a kind of a meta-analysis sort of deal with it. And what I noticed is every one of the ones that I've read, the conclusion was always the same. It was, uh, need more studies. And the only one that didn't say that was this one. They said, uh, this was really dramatic. This is what you should be doing, which I don't think most people did. So I don't think, I, does anyone do that? Use phenobarbital right alongside as the first line treatment. I haven't really found anyone who does it, but that's what the Cochrane Review said to do. So that was really, again, cutting a length of stay in half by changing the medication is really, really dramatic. So uh, the other one that's come on, and I think some of you were involved in the study comparing morphine and methadone. This was a study from, um, from Maine. This was giving half the kids uh, methadone and half morphine and found the babies who got methadone had a shorter length of stay. And then clonidine. Clonidine was something that we started using, uh, and this was based on a study that came out of Johns Hopkins where they gave half the kids clonidine uh, plus tincture of opium and half the kids uh, just uh, tincture of opium and found the kids who, who got clonidine had a slightly shorter length of stay. And the idea of clonidine is it sort of blocks that norepinephrine release and so it should help. It's used in adults. Adults will use clonidine patches for withdrawal. So another thing I learned from the wire. Um, and so that was kind of, that, that's kind of where we were when I started. And I started as a hospitalist in 2006. And so the standard approach generally that I gleaned was that, that the, the treatment, a lot, of, a lot of times when we consider treatment, we're thinking really about medications. We've done efforts to increase the non-pharmacologic stuff, but, but the medication is really when we think about treating babies, that's what we're doing. Uh, most of the management, particularly with medication, has been in NICUs over time. That has changed in some areas. Uh, and you will see quite a bit of variation actually in, in where uh, babies are managed. You'll see some that are exclusively in NICUs, uh, some in nurseries, some on general inpatient units, some outpatient, and often a combination of some or all of those things. And so I think the most common pairing is uh, nursery, and then when you need medications, you go to the NICU. That's the most common thing you'll see, but uh, it's some combination of those things. But the NICU is kind of the mainstay of it. And then, of course, Finnegan scores. Uh, there are lots of other scoring tools out there. 
Um, there are ones that have, the Finnegan is pretty long, as you've all noticed, and they have, there have been ones that have been made that have shortened it considerably with exactly the same results, and does anyone use those? No. Uh, so when they, when they did a, a survey a number of years ago about what everyone was using, about 98% of places were using Finnegan. So there are some, some folks who have used the mother tool, which is a, a slight variation of it. Most of it's sort of built off the Finnegan. And so that's kind of the main safe treatment. And also not just, not just the Finnegan, but the, the eight scores of eight, two or three scores of eight is the, is the key to treatment. And then medication dosing. Once you start uh, medication, you usually wean it by... Uh, either every day or every other day, and you, the usual amount is about 10% of the original dose. Does that sound familiar to people? Somewhere in that range, yeah. And, and, uh, and then, uh, like any good NICU, the staff is really responsible for caring for the baby. And so they're, they're the ones in there on the front lines doing everything. And so this is very similar to what we were doing at Yale. Uh, we were, when I started, we were using, uh, what, what happened is when the baby was born, they would go from the delivery room to the NICU, and they'd be they have been one of those big NICU rooms, and they would be monitored using the Finnegan tool. And as soon as they got three scores of eight, they would be started on uh, morphine and clonidine. We eventually stopped using clonidine um, after a couple of years because there was a lot of uh, side effects. We, ended, we were stopping it in 30% of the kids because they had low heart rates. So we got rid of that entirely. But basically, so you get, you get three scores of eight, you start morphine. And at the time, we've now built this beautiful new NICU at the time, we had a NICU that was uh, a little too small for what we needed. And so this was a population that sort of popped off. So after about a week to 10 days, these babies would get, once the, the, they felt like they had stabilized the dose of morphine, they would transfer the babies up to the general inpatient unit where the hospitals would take care of them, and that was me. And, that would, and we would go through the protocol. And our protocol was actually to wean the medications by 10% of the original dose every other day. So you had to have two days of your scores below eight before you could go down by 10% of the original dose, which if you kind of work out the math, it's hard to have a length of stay much longer than three and a half or four weeks, which is where we were. We were right at four weeks. Uh, and that's kind of how we did it. And it was pretty easy. Um, and as a, as a hospitalist, um, I had just started uh, doing this. Uh, there's no extra training. Uh, there is now, but at the time, I finished residency and went camping for a week and it came back and I was, I was in charge of the floor. Um, and so that was a lot I had to learn and we had a protocol that all the kind of old guys had come up with and this is just how we did it. This was not a population that was uh, terribly interesting to me. It was also one, normally we're turning kids over uh, on the floors very quickly. Kids come in with asthma, they're staying for a day or two. Our average length of stay for most kids is, is about two days and for these kids it was 28 days. And so, and it was a very, there wasn't anything to do either because you just followed the protocol. What we found a lot of times is we, they'd be there for four weeks. We wouldn't see the, the parents usually all that often. they come and visit. I, there were two families during these couple of years that I, I remember roomed in and it was, a, it was a, a little bit of a heavy lift for us to, to deal with that. But otherwise, we would kind of see the family periodically and at the end, we, the kid would be here for four weeks and we would say, okay, everything's going great. You guys are ready to go home tomorrow. And we would often hear, oh, we're not ready to go. Are you kidding me? We can't, we don't even have a crib yet. What are you talking about? And so we'd be ready to go, and it would still take another day or two for them to get everything ready because they were just unprepared to go home, even though it had been a month, just because they got, they got to kind of pretend that they didn't have a baby for that, that time. And so that's kind of how we did it because we took care of the baby, and it was easier for us to care for the baby than it was to deal with the family with this. This wasn't, who, who wanted to deal with these, these families? This was, a, um, it, it, it tended to make the staff sort of angry deal with these families, and it was harder. One of, one of our uh, nurse leaders in this described how, you know, normally they take a lot of pride in their, and in, in how they care for the families, not just the babies. They would, you know, make up the bed for the family to sleep in and, you know, fluff the pillow. But for these families, they would kind of throw the sheets on the bed. They were trying to get them to not stay if they could. And so that's kind of where we were when we started. What I want you to do is I want you to connect all nine of these dots using four lines without taking your pen off the paper, off the proverbial paper, okay? So four lines, don't take your pen up, connect all the dots. Okay, so what you gotta do is this, right? So in order to get all the to work, you have to go outside of the box, okay? So that is actually where that saying comes from, is from this game. It's thinking outside the box. 
Now, normally when we think about thinking outside the box, we think like, oh, everyone's talking about like, should it be one or two or three? And the answer is actually purple. If you go over here and, and you're thinking totally something different, but that's actually not what it means. And so if you, if you think about it, why did, why did everyone have trouble with this? It's because we were supposed to connect these nine dots. There, this isn't a box. This is nine dots. But your mind, you made it a box. So the idea of, of thinking outside the box is to realize that it isn't a box. It's to take away those rules that you placed upon it yourself. You put the rule that this was a box on there. It's not just you. Everybody does this, obviously. But the idea of, the, of thinking outside the box is to realize you are not bound by this. As I mentioned, we're, our length of stays are usually two days. We're trying to get people in and out of the hospital so we can create more beds and find things and move people along. And plus, I'm lazy. I don't want to deal with people longer than I have to. Um, and so uh, what we started to notice is watching these babies uh, is that you'd have these days where the kid was totally fine, but we had gone down on the medication by this tiny amount the day before. And did we really have to wait a whole other day to do it? And that seemed sort of silly. And so we just sort of fudged that part of our protocol. We didn't tell anybody. We didn't change the protocol. We just said, let's just, if they're OK the next day, let's just go down by this tiny amount of medication again. Uh, and then that's it. So we just started doing that. We didn't do really much else at that point. But what happened is, and I don't know, even know how we, I wasn't looking at this data at all, but somebody pulled this data and said our length of stay uh, from 2003 to 2006 was 28 days. And from 2006 to 2009 was 22 and a half days, which according to Stephen's study was like exactly the national average. And so uh, again, we weren't trying to reduce length. They were just sort of annoyed by the kid who seemed fine. Could we go down on a small amount? But one of our uh, one of our old residents had been moonlighting at Middlesex Hospital, which is 45 minutes up the road from us. Um, and they their length say was about six weeks for these kids, and uh, which is not so far. You can certainly see lots of that those types of lengths stay in literature at the time, and. They wanted to know what amazing things we were doing to get our length of stay down this much. This is a big deal. If you can drop your length of stay by four or five days, uh, that's pretty amazing. Or whatever it was here, it was almost six days. So if you line up all of these studies, what do you find? So DTO is diluted tincture of opium. That's the tincture of opium. So you have this tincture of opium versus tincture of opium plus clonidine, which is a study from Johns Hopkins. Length stay, uh, median length stay 17 days versus 12 days. For morphine versus phenobarbital, it was eight days versus 12 days. Morphine versus tincture of opium, 30 days versus 27 days. Uh, tincture of opium versus tincture of opium plus phenobarbital, that's the one that was so powerful from Brown, where they cut the length of stay in half. They cut it from 79 days to 38 days. So when you do one of those Cochrane reviews, they just sort of throw in the, the p values. They don't really look at the raw numbers. Um, and then methadone versus morphine, the one from Maine, was 17 days versus 24 days. There are more of these studies two, about two years ago. Um, the New England Journal of Medicine published one on buprenorphine versus morphine. Uh, morphine was 33 days. Buprenorphine was 21 days. Same idea. OK, so something seems weird here. So if we just now remember, these are all newborn babies. The exposures are fairly similar. The protocols are all very fairly similar. But if you look at the places with tincture of opium, you have lengths of stay ranging from 17 days to 79 days. And for morphine, it's eight days to 30 days, or if we include the New England Journal article more recently, it's 33 days. So that's a pretty big spread. So wh what other disease processes do you see a spread like that in your length of stay, with, with otherwise things being pretty similar? Yeah, there isn't anything. This is crazy. This makes no sense whatsoever. <laughs> Yeah, and so, and again, you have something like 79 days to 38 days. So yes, it cut it in half, but it cut it from incredibly long to incredibly long. And so that may not be that valuable. And so if you look at, yes, it cut it, but it also had the long, 38 was still longer than any of their length of stay on the board. So I'm not sure how valuable that is. So what do we do with this information? What does it mean? And so we thought, uh, you know what we think this means? Is we don't know, but, uh, but <laughs> But it does seem like maybe it's not all about the medication. That was sort of what the best we came up with. Was this, this doesn't, because there was something that was sort of interesting when you went back and looked at these studies. Now, they all list the first line treatment, as we said, as, as non-pharmacologic care. And what is non-pharmacologic care? It's pretty much baby care. So it's, 
it's the holding the baby, it's feeding them on demand, which we were really good at. We always did feeding on demand as long as the demand was every three hours. And so, uh, it was anything like that, and the baby, has anyone ever heard that the baby isn't due to eat yet? Has anyone had a baby before? <laughs> has anyone said that to your own baby? Oh, no, no. Oh, no, it's not time. Just wait another hour. I'll be over here. It'll be fine. Yeah, that's not how babies work or how, you know, parent, you know, it's just, it's not how it's done. But if you're trying to run a NICU and you have three other babies you have to go see, you kind of have to have a schedule. So I get it, but it doesn't make sense for, like, the baby. Um, <laughs> So that's kind of, uh, so, so that, that's the non-pharmacologic stuff is like that, and it's holding the baby. That, these are really radical ideas. This is incredibly innovative stuff. So holding the babies, rocking them, that kind of thing, shushing, doing the regular sort of the five S's, that kind of stuff. So that's non-pharmacologic care. That's the first line treatment, and that's what everybody said in these studies. And, how, and so how many of them controlled for those things? None of them. How many, some of them didn't even really mention them. So you can imagine doing a study the other way. Let's say you wanted to study swaddling. And you said, yeah, I don't know, some of these kids got morphine and some did. I don't know which ones got them. And it doesn't, who, you know, whatever. That you'd sort of be laughed at. That would never, you, you haven't seen that study because it would never get published. But because it's non-pharmacologic care and it doesn't seem that real, then it's sort of OK. It's just something we do. Yeah, everyone, we sort of all do that. And then, then we get to the real stuff, which is the medication. And so if you look at the AAP guidelines, they list non-pharmacologic care as the first line treatment. And they spend 56 words on it. And they spend 1,652 on medication. It's the same idea. So I, I don't know why this is, but it just doesn't seem very like doctor. You know, if you're, if you're a, I'm not a neonatologist, but if you're putting kids on ECMO and doing all this life-saving stuff, the idea of doing this as a real treatment, I think, is, is a tougher sell. Um, and so as a. As a uh, hospitalist, we're sort of aware that, that our, our, our biggest sort of claim to fame is we're really good at doing nothing, is that we're, we're aware that if you have a cold, we can't do anything about it. And so we stop giving you stuff, and we just wait for you to get better. And so we're sort of more into that kind of stuff. I'm going to show you our data as we go forward. This is a control chart, and I am going to orient you to this for those who are not as big on quality improvement stuff. So. Um, each yellow dot is a patient and their length of stay. The, the uh, x-axis is just the dates. And it starts at 2008 and goes, and, and really when we started was 2010. So this is kind of our baseline data. Um, and the y-axis is our length of stay in days. And so each yellow dot is an individual patient. And our black line is our, our, our length of stay, our average length of stay, which started out at 22 and a half days. Um, the, the red line on the top, and there's one on the bottom, those are called the control limits. And that's essentially three standard deviations from the mean. And the way to think about that is that 99% of your values should fall between those red lines. And so that can be useful if you're trying to figure out, like, hey, what could happen on this next patient? You'd expect them to fall between those two uh, red lines, which isn't that helpful right now because it would say, all right, our next baby uh, with NAS is going to say somewhere between 0 and 47 days. And so that's not, for planning purposes, not that helpful. Uh, and then the green line is actually the Vermont-Oxford length of stay number, which is sort of the best big study to reduce length of stay, which was at 19 days, which is sort of like the goal. You try to, and, and Stephen will correct me when, during the panel how I screwed this up. Um, OK, and so that's sort of where we started. Uh, and you can see, so it's a, so when you're trying to improve this stuff, and, and I can tell you actually, this, the secret is we weren't actually trying to reduce our length of stay with this. Our whole goal as we were going forward with this was to try to have this go better for the baby and the mom. And then we sort of turned it, you have to pick metrics, and we said, well, probably if it's going better, the baby will probably stay not as long in the hospital. But it wasn't, it, that wasn't our driving force. And so what you want to see if we're improving this is we'd like to see the black line go down, so our length of stay would go down. And we'd like to see the red lines get closer together. And that means there's going to be less variation in what we're doing. OK, so that's where we are. So we'll, we'll take it as we come here. So why were we doing all the things we're doing? Yeah, those five things were, were the standard of care. So why were medications the first line treatment? Why was that how we did it? And, um, and we didn't have a great answer for that. And we sort of talked about that. This just seemed to be that there wasn't a lot of respect given for non-pharmacologic care. There certainly is more now, and that's in the modules, and people are starting to get that that's a real thing. Um, but we looked at, uh, we had to, of course, look, look to Canada. And, uh, and there's a study from Vancouver where they did this thing. And this is just, this is pretty wild. Bear with me here. They took the baby and the mom, and they put them together. 
And it was one of those ideas that was just crazy enough to work. And, it, uh, and actually, it turned out, both the baby and the mom did better when they did that. Who would have thought that, that separating babies from their moms wasn't the best idea? And so this seemed to work better. And we said, oh, well, that, that, that seems to track with you know, common sense. So let's go with that. And so we said, OK, how do we get the babies and moms to be together? And we were noticing things with our, with our keen, keen, uh, uh, keen observation that when the baby and the mom were together, the baby seemed to do better. And so you'd have like three nights in a row where the mom was staying and the baby would do fine. And the fourth night, she couldn't stay. And then you'd get three scores of eight in the morning. And then you have to decide in the morning, well, OK, does this baby need uh, more morphine or more mom? And so we started to think like, hey, maybe the baby needs more mom. And so that's kind of where we came from with this. So we said, OK, so medications are supposed to be. And even you can see with a lot of studies, you don't get a diagnosis of NAS unless you're given medication. And so you can think of what other disease process does that not count as the disease until you give the second line treatment. And there aren't any of those either. So that's not how we define it. And this is something where there's, there isn't an agreement. I think we actually might disagree on this one. Um, uh, but there, there is some disagreement of what actually counts as NAS. And I would say if you're having, you know, if you have the exposure and you have the withdrawal, that's sort of who we're, that's who we're focused on. However we want to call them, that's what we're looking at. If you have, you're exposed and you have withdrawal signs, then we're interested. And so, because it doesn't really make sense that suddenly we've eliminated the diagnosis by, by not giving medication as often. So, so we, we said, oh, we, we agree now. Good, good. Sorry. <laughs> Take it back. He's going to have, he, this gonna, I think most of it's just going to be him correcting me. That's going to be the, the next session. Um, so, so I think that's, so, so, so that says, sort of doesn't make sense of a way to, uh, to, to diagnose it, to say it's just about the medication. So, so we were trying to actually do the first line treatment. You're going to find that what we were doing, I think, is one of the least innovative uh, projects you can find, is that we just started to essentially follow the guidelines, really, which says that non-pharmacologic care, we just took it to a little more of an extreme. OK, so, we, so the first thing we did is we really said, OK, let's actually, instead of just saying, yeah, non-pharmacologic care is great, let's, let's actually focus on it. So we had some control. And this is, again, this is all done on our inpatient unit. The NICU didn't even know we were doing anything for many, many years. We were just doing this on our own and just kind of playing around. I was, the, uh, I was in charge of the infant toddler unit. There were, there were two hospitalists at the time, and the other guy had a little bit of seniority. And so he got to choose whether he wanted to be on the infant toddler or the school age unit. And he chose the school age unit, and he gave two reasons. One is he didn't want to take care of these babies, and the other one he said he liked teenagers which nobody believes that. So pretty much he doesn't want to take care of these babies. So, so I kind of got stuck in this, in this role. But, so we said, OK, but we have control of the environment a little bit more. So we're going to make sure we keep a, a low stimulation environment. We're going to have the TVs off. We're going to try to encourage the, the, the moms to stick around as much as we can. We're going to try to feed the babies when they were hungry. This is radical stuff, as you can see. Um, and, and make sure we're trying to hold the babies more, using volunteers more, and, and doing those kinds of things, and really sort of standardizing it. Uh, but really focusing on the moms being there, kind of based on the study. So we really got the moms to stay more. And this is what we saw with our length of stay. So our length of stay went from um, 22 and a half days down to 13 days. So already, already below the whole Vermont Oxford thing, doing this really, just doing this really aggressively. And you can see it got a lot more. Uh, we were also getting the baby slightly earlier, so we had a little more control over it. Sometimes we were getting them before the medications had started. So we, were, we, we had a, a real big change here. And when we thought about this, we said, oh my god, this is like, a, this is like an eight-day change in length of stay, or even more than that. If this were a medication, let's say I'd come up with a medication, then I would be on a beach somewhere. But, um, but we, we said, OK, well, it's not a medication, but what, it, what is it? Well, the medication is mom. So it's really, well, the difference is we're having the moms there all the time. We're telling them, you hold the babies, you do the stuff, and you, you, you got to stay. We would kind of fight with their programs to get them to stay more. And so we saw this big change, and we realized that was the secret sauce. It wasn't anything else. It was just that the moms were there more. And so when the moms were there, this worked better. And so if mom is the medication for this, let's think of it in those terms. OK, so that's, that was sort of our first tenet of this. Like we thought, if you have pneumonia, Mom is the antibiotics, OK? And so just have that mindset. And you think about how you go about things. And that brought us to where we were taking care of our babies. We were putting them in the NICU. And the NICU is a place where the parents could visit. 
but they couldn't stay, and not while we were rounding because they were HIPAA things, so you couldn't really come in while we were rounding, but you could come in any other time, and we were gonna be really welcoming to you there too, it was gonna be great. Um, uh, and so we essentially, what we could do, and we were gonna feed you again when you were hungry as long as it was every three hours, and uh, so basically the only thing we could do was really swaddle you. So this was essentially an area of the hospital that if you had pneumonia, we would send you to, but we didn't have antibiotics. And so if you think of those terms, because their mom wasn't going to be there. And so we had another area of the hospital where we had antibiotics, but we were going to send you to the place that didn't have it. So would we ever do that for anything other than NAS? No, it's crazy. It doesn't make any sense. But it's what we were doing. So this is the website photo of our, of our NICU. Uh, you, can, you can see that it's, this is, our, again, our new NICU is actually a single room. We could, act, uh, we, could, we, we could do a lot of this stuff. And that opened about a year and a half ago. But this, was, this is where we were working. Um, and it's, it's bright, it's bustling, it's, one of, it's like the cafeteria style, the barracks kind of deal where you have 12 babies in the room and, and I snuck in and took like a, a, a picture of it and that's actually you know, what, what it really looks like. Uh, and you can see the area where the mom can stay, the nice bed where she can lie down. Oh no, you just have the chair with the tape on it with its back to the, to the isolate. So that's sort of what we were dealing with. Um, so this is like a perfect environment, and it's loud because there's so much going on. There's all these interventions to try to get the noise down below what the recommended levels are, and we can never quite pull it off. Um, so uh, we never could. We can now because we're in single rooms. We couldn't, couldn't at this point despite all these efforts. So this is what it was. So it was like a perfect environment of how not to do non-pharmacologic care. You could swaddle the babies. That was it. And so... Uh, and. These were, this is like, we have an intense NICU, so we were just talking about this, like, the NICU nurses, I don't know if we have a lot of NICU nurses here, but not fans of babies crying usually. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> yes. So this is, and sometimes these guys, if you've met one of them, they sometimes will cry. Um, so uh, so this, was, this was sort of like not the best environment for these guys. And so, and we thought like, well, okay, well, why do they go to the NICU? So what about them requires intensive care? So they don't need to be intubated. They don't need lines. What is it that they need that's intensive care? And I don't know what the answer to that is. And so the, the best answer I've gotten is seizures, that these babies can have seizures. Has anyone seen a lot of seizures in these guys? No, me neither. So the, uh, the study that this is based on comes from a 1973 or 72 study where it said that 2 to 11% of these kids will have seizures. And that's the one that always gets quoted, which is a pretty broad range, by the way, 2 to 11%. I don't, and so uh, and it turns out that one of the guys who wrote that study was in our health system. He just retired last year. He's been sort of retiring over the last 10 years, but he finally retired. And we got to ask him, what's going on? Like, no one's replicated. I was like, yeah, we weren't really sure if those were seizures. So, um, so that was a bummer. Um, so there, there's that. Uh, so, and, and it hasn't really been replicated. Other people have seen seizures in these, because they're just not totally surprising. It's not... Uh, opioid withdrawal is not, uh, in other age groups, is not associated with seizures. Other withdrawals, like benzo withdrawal certainly is. So if you do a benzo withdrawal, I think it would be, it's probably prudent to be a little more concerned about that. Uh, but then we thought about that, like, oh, let's say it doesn't look like it's, it actually is a real problem, but if it were, uh, would we, is it appropriate to be in the NICU for that? And we thought, okay, if you were a two-day-old and you went home uh, and you had a seizure, you would come back and go to our neurology unit, our seizure unit, not to our NICU. And we don't actually um, hospitalize or put people in intensive care unit because they might have seizures. Um, I don't know if anyone heard of epilepsy. Those people do not live in ICUs, just a, it's a spoiler. So it's not actually something we would do anyway. So uh, there isn't something magical that you have in the ICU for seizures either. So first of all, it's not a problem and in our institution. It wouldn't, doesn't make any sense anyway. So, so why, what were the other reasons these kids were in the NICU? And the answer was, that's where they've always been. And so what we found when we looked at all of these questions, the answer was the same. What we're doing, the reason we're doing the things we're doing today is because that's what we were doing yesterday. And that was really it. And we went back, why did they go to the NICU? Well, they always went to the NICU. That was the answer. Well, who was the one who decided they should go to the NICU? And we had, the, we had some really older guys who were running this, and they didn't know either. <laughs> he just retired, too. <laughs> um, they didn't know either. That's just what we've always done. And if you go back, if you go back way back in literature, like from the 50s and the, and the late 1800s, the stuff that gets reported about NAS is the mortality rates are extremely, extremely high. And the stuff that sort of settled that down was when 
uh, methadone, became, methadone treatment came in in the 60s, and the stuff that Dr. Finnegan did to really standardize it, mortality rate really became almost non-existent for this. But it was a, that was a big deal in the beginning. And they were trying to save these babies' lives and figure out what to do. So that was, that was sort of where, where, where the history is coming from. But that's not really where we are now. So there really wasn't a great reason for the babies to be in the NICU. And the only reason, the, the, real, the real main reason is because, well, that's where we, that's where we have to give them morphine, right? Because you, if you've got to give them morphine, you've got to move them to the NICU. That's the most, most commonly the situation where you have where kids will be in the nursery and they get transferred to the NICU because they need morphine. Because you can only give morphine in a NICU, right? Because that's one of those boxes. That's not a real rule. That's a made-up rule. Uh, or the monitoring, or whatever it is, that's one of those things you say, well, we can't do that. Well, is that right? You can't do that? Or is that just something that you don't do? And most of the stuff, this is where you have to look for, is that a box that you created yourself? And it probably is. And so if you think about what the actual treatment, so where else do we say, okay, all right, you're getting worse. What we need to do is stop doing the first line treatment entirely and then, and then give you the second line treatment. So normally when you do that, you add on. You have first line treatment, then you add on second line treatment. But in our situation, if you went to the NICU, you essentially took away the first line treatment. It doesn't make any sense. So if we thought it was actually probably harmful for our kids to be in the NICU because we couldn't do the first line treatment. We couldn't give these kids antibiotics. So this was our, uh, this actually isn't our, this is a, a stock photo of an inpatient unit. Ours isn't that nice. Things are leaking. It's a disaster. But it is, uh, <laughs> don't come. Uh, so it's, uh, but it is it's mostly single rooms. There's a place for at least one parent to sleep. There's often a refrigerator you can move in. You can control the environment. You can be there all the time. Somebody, family member, can be there all the time. And you can totally control the environment. You can totally deliver all the first line treatment. So we said, OK, what we need to do is stop having these kids. Remember, in our institution, the kids were going from the delivery room right to the NICU. We said, OK, let's do that. Let, let's, the medication is the mom. We need to, the concept is we need to keep mom and baby together. Don't care where that happens. Mom and baby have to be together. Let's have them go to the newborn nursery. That seems easy enough. That's what I think a lot of places do, newborn nursery. And then if they get worse, they can, they can their withdrawal gets bad, they can leave. It took 18 months of negotiating to convince the nursery to do that, because they were like, so wait, so we're not caring for these babies, and now you want us to. And they're like, yeah, we'll take a pass on that, thanks. You guys sound like you're having so much fun doing it, but we're going to let you keep doing it. So there were some who thought, this seems like the right thing to do, but a lot of people were really resistant. They'd heard how tough these families were to deal with. They didn't want to do it. And so finally got them to agree to do it. Uh, and the idea was as soon as if they had another medical problem, they would go to the NICU. If, they got, um, if they, their scores got above eight, then they could get transferred. The baby would get transferred to the inpatient unit, and then the mom would follow when she was discharged. And so that was the agreement. The first uh, six babies uh, that we did this with all had another medical problem uh, and immediately were transferred to the NICU that quickly resolved upon arriving in the NICU. So there's a little bit of a protest vote to start with. Um, and then that kind of settled it out. And, and initially, we would see that we'd have these babies transferred down with Finnegan scores of 22. And we would score them, it would be like a six. And we'd be like, oh, I think they're maybe, maybe a little more excited about this uh, than they should be. But, so that started, that, that, so we, we eventually got that working because we said the idea, the concept of this is mom and baby need to stay together. This is not a radical concept. Okay, and so we started doing that and we had more, we had, our length stay went down to 10 days. And now you can see something that's sort of funny in the middle there. The red lines actually got further apart and there's a bunch of, of um, yellow dots that are quite a bit higher. And this is still, the, the NICU doesn't, didn't really know that we were doing a whole lot different and this was a time where they had a very low census. So if they were getting a, uh, a baby going through withdrawal, they kept them through the whole hospitalization because they were just trying to fill their beds. And so those are those really long things to stay in there. Those are the ones that we never saw on the floor. But overall, the, the average still stayed low. OK, now we started to look at Finnegan scores. OK, so Finnegan scores are, of course, the law. Everyone does Finnegan scores. Everyone here does Finnegan scores, yes? Everyone loves them? Everyone, who, who was in the room when you decided to use the Finnegan tool? No? Nobody? OK. Who decided to use a score of cutoff of 8? So you all use 8, right, as a cutoff? So and no one here decided? OK. Does anyone know where it comes from? The, the, lo the lots of studies that show that that was the right number? OK. So uh, we'll get to that in a second. So uh, everyone, who's a big fan of Finnegan score? 
Anyone? Nobody. So no one's a big fan of it, but you all use it. And nobody decided to use it, and nobody picked the number. OK, might be, might be time for a change. OK, you're allowed to say you like it. There's, I mean, it had a real great benefit. It was a, it was a, it was a norm, like, that was game changing in the 70s to have this come in. Um, but there's some, some, so those of you who have uh, actually done the scores, some of this will sound a little bit familiar. There's some, there's some interesting things about this. Now, uh, the, the, actually, the first baby I showed was my own now nine-year-old, who was very instrumental in us changing our practice in the hospital. He was not an NAS baby, but he was a terrible baby. <laughs> <laughs> he is a delightful nine-year-old now, but he could not have been worse. And so I just, as I'm bouncing around, I thought, like, God, if I went to the pediatrician and said, what dose of phenobarbital are you going to give them? They would have had that response. But if he was an NAS baby, he would have been loaded up on everything. And so he had some of these things, but he did not have three of these things, which are really specific to withdrawal. Uh, and that, that is the, the, the uh, tremors when undisturbed. You can see that in, in, in newborn babies, of course, but not as consistently as you will in this. This is sort of specific to withdrawal. The uh, hyperactive moro, if anyone wants to teach anyone a moro reflex, these are your go-to babies. That is, that, is un, that is pretty specific to withdrawal. And then uh, the hypertonicity, the increased tone. And so I'm yet to see a methadone-exposed baby who does not have increased tone. So the, the, the biggest test you can do is you lift them up by their arms, and they come up like a board. You've all seen that. So that doesn't happen in other babies. And that didn't happen with my, my guy. But he had a lot of these other things. And so, um, so, so I would say, you know, if you, if you have this and, you, and you're hypertonic like that, then you have, you have withdrawal. So you, you're having the withdrawal syndrome. You're experiencing it. So that would be, if you have the exposure and you have one of those signs, then I, to me, you have, that's a, that's a diagnosis for us. Um, and I am yet to see a, a methadone-exposed baby who does not have that. I've seen some buprenorphine-exposed infants where I can't find any signs of withdrawal, but never, I've yet to find a methadone one who does. Um, and so what you can think about, there's a couple issues with the scoring tool. And so you may have a kid who's got two scores of eight, and he's got a score of seven. All right. Now, he has sneezed three times in an indeterminate period of time, which, of course, we all know is totally fine. But then he sneezes a fourth time. And so, and that's, of course, no good. And so he gets an extra point, And now, in our place, he gets a dose of morphine, except he doesn't get a dose of morphine. He gets 100 doses of morphine, right? Because he gets it every three hours, and he's got to stabilize the dose. And then we go through our very slow wean. And so he's going to end up with at least 100 doses of morphine because of that extra sneeze. Uh, and that may be a sign of withdrawal, but it also may be something that we don't actually care about. So this has done a nice job of cataloging the signs of withdrawal. But if I concede that the baby is withdrawing, maybe it's not so important to count sneezes. Now, again, eight, of course, is the, is the go-to number. And I'm going to show you now, this is going to be another take home. This is where it comes from, OK? It comes from the 1975 paper. The infant with a score of seven or less was not treated with drugs for the absence syndrome because, in our experience, he would recover rapidly with swaddling and demand feedings. Infants whose score was eight or above were treated pharmacologically. That's it. No follow-up studies. So that's that paragraph. They chose eight because they chose eight. And so that's what we've been doing for the last 40 whatever years is because of that paragraph. That's what they did in 1975. And we all said, OK. Um, so problems with the Finnegan. So if you look at the current state of where it is, it hasn't, you know, it's not, it's not been rigorously compared to, to other scoring tools. But if you use that, you will have the longest lengths of stay of anything in pediatrics outside of prematurity. So you get long lengths of stay, and you'll use lots and lots of medications whose safety we're still not so sure of. Uh, the purpose of treatment is just to get the score below 8. I don't need to see the baby. I don't care which of those pop up or not, as long as I can get it below eight. If, if, you, can, if you hid the sneeze from me, I'm fine with that. As long as I didn't see it, it's OK. Um, so that's the whole thing. I don't, need to, I don't need to see the baby. I don't need to have, you know how the baby's doing. I just need to know what the number is. Um, now, this is a, this is a, 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 a tricky one. So I, I did mention the hyperactive moro and the uh, tremors uh, when disturbed. So now, uh, a lot of you guys have, have, uh, have done the scoring, so you tell me, um, how do you do test the baby's moro and test the baby's tremors with this, with, uh, when disturbed without disturbing them? Anyone? Anyone got a secret for that? 
No, it's probably, probably really difficult. So if you think about what the treatment is, we're trying to keep them calm and quiet. And in order to do, and this is pre preaching to the choir here, I think, in order to do the score, you have to unwrap them and get them to do stuff. So you have developed systems to try to work around this and to disturb the baby as little as possible, but it is what it calls for. You must disturb the baby. In order to know what their score is, you have to see if you can get them to do things can't score their hyperactive moro unless you do a moro, and you can't tell if they have tremors when they're disturbed unless you disturb them. So you've got to see if you can get them to do stuff, right? So you have to see if you can get them to withdraw. They may be calm, but you've got to do it. So you try to do it around when they're eating, so maybe they're already sort of up a little bit, but you've got to see if you can get, if you can exacerbate those signs of withdrawal so you can write your score down. Does that sound correct? That sounds like a strange thing to do. So in my mind, that sounds like we might actually be causing harm by doing this score. So that is concerning. It could also be slow to respond. So we would do our scores every four hours. I don't know how often you do them. We'll do it every two hours. But we would do them every four hours. So you could have a baby who is screaming at 10 AM. We do our first score at noon. The score is 10. We don't do anything with that. No one even knows about it. Baby's still screaming. Next score is at 4 o'clock. Still screaming. Another score of 10. Nobody does anything. Nobody even knows about it. Next score is at 8 PM. Another score of 10. Now we're going to pay attention 10 hours later. We're going to actually intervene and we're going to give the baby some morphine or go up on our dose. So that is very slow to respond. It's also, as, as we mentioned, we have listed all these signs of withdrawal, uh, but we don't care about all of them. I know sneezing is important and yawning is probably even more important, but maybe not something you give these powerful, powerful medications for. So it's, you're treating an extra sneeze or an extra yawn. Uh, with these powerful medications. And these are things that I think we just don't care about. Where, where else do we count sneezes and yawns? Where else do we think that's important? <laughs> Again, if I concede that these babies are going through withdrawal, counting these I don't think is important. So if these things aren't important, what is? And so that's what we were stuck with here. And so we said, OK, we're going to stop using the Finnegan score. I know, very radical. We stopped using it. And the way we did this, again, we were just doing this on our unit, and it was really me making fun of the Finnegan score for like a year and a half, and people were like, fine, you can stop, you know, the, the people got okay with it. Because it was the same thing, like it's what we've been doing forever. It is the law. It is how could you not do that? It is the law. It is the box that we have created. You must do it this way. How could you do it any other way? It's what everybody does. So we stopped using it, and we had to think about what we actually cared about. And so we said, okay, we know these babies are withdrawing, and what do we want them to do? Well, we want them to be Babies. We want them to do what babies do. So what's the job description of a baby? Well, they're supposed to be able to eat, they're supposed to be able to sleep, and you should be able to calm them down. They shouldn't have colic or anything at this age, so you should be able to console them. They should be able to poop as well, but as you all know, not really an issue here, so we didn't include that one. So we said, can the baby eat, can the baby sleep, and can the baby be consoled? So another way to think about this, if you have a baby who is quiet in your arms, who eats well and sleeps well, what's the medication for? So we are, in a, uh, we are in a medical system that is very slow to respond to things. And for once, we took advantage of that. So we were not using um, Finnegan, but it was still in our protocols through the whole health system. And in order to get it changed, you have to get like the Pope has to bless it and all this other stuff has to happen. So we knew it was going to take like a couple of years until they, they didn't, the nurses didn't have to get the scores anymore. So we looked at 50 babies who were admitted to our inpatient unit um, over about a year and a half. And we were still getting the Finnegan scores basically every four hours. And they were in the chart somewhere. We weren't looking at them. We weren't using them. Nobody was reporting them. But they were just they were in there that we could, we, could, uh, we could go get them. But we started using our management based on eat, sleep, and console. So in other words, if you were able to eat well and sleep well and be consoled, then we didn't give you any medication. And if you were not, if you were not consolable, the first thing we did wasn't to give you medication. We did what you would normally do, which was to look at the first line treatment and try to increase it if you could. And so, um, and so that's that's what we did. So I'll give you. So so that's kind of how we went about that. So that was the idea. So you, so you, and if that didn't work, then we gave you medication, and we could do it right then. So it responded quickly. So you would do it. You could get medications like 15 minutes instead of 10 hours later. So you'd have this baby who's inconsolable. We tried everything that we could do, and, uh, and 
If, the, if it didn't work, then we gave medication. We could do it right away. Okay, so we looked at the proportion of infants that we gave morphine to versus the proportion who were treated with morphine using the Finnegan approach. So, so in other words, we were using, we were using the, uh, the Eat, Sleep, Console idea. And so we looked at how many we actually gave morphine to versus how many had three scores of eight, basically. So if they had three scores of eight, we would have used morphine. So we were able to compare those two groups. And we looked how often they disagreed. In other words, on this day, Finnegan told us to give morphine, and we didn't. How did the baby do the next day? OK, so here's what we found. So there's 50 babies. Uh, if we used Finnegan, we would have given 62% of them morphine. We only gave 12% of them. So there was 31 babies who, got, who would have gotten morphine. We actually only gave them the six. So that's 25 out of 50 babies who did not get morphine. Again, not a dose of morphine, but those 80 to 100 doses we're talking about. There were 78 days where using the Eat, Sleep, Console led to less morphine than predicted by the Finnegan. And the following day, the average Finnegan score was still down by almost a point, and in 70% of cases, it was down. There were two cases where we went the other direction, where we had a baby whose Finnegan scores weren't that high but was inconsolable, who we gave morphine to. Even giving morphine to, the Finnegan scores were still increased the next day. OK. so. Medication dosing. So once we start medication, we go through our weaning protocols uh, that I think are probably pretty consistent. So where did those come from? So what is it about the earth rotating one time that it doesn't have anything to do with pharmacokinetics of morphine or anything like that? So what is it about that that that's how we wean the morphine? Right. Who, was, who decided this approach? Anyone? No. This is what we've always done. Uh, and so that is based on how much literature in newborns? None. Right. So this is just what we've always done. So why do we do it that way? I don't know either. So what we started to realize, and it sounds like we were really smart. This is over years, and we felt like idiots every time we came up with one of these things because like, we were trying to think of this stuff, and, we could, and it took us years to think of these really basic and obvious things. So, so we, were, uh, we would have some kids who would still go to the NICU, and those kids would often be started on morphine, and they would transfer it up to us on day five or six, and we would say, you know, well, we probably wouldn't have started that kid on morphine, but we'll just go through this slow wean anyway. And then we said, like, why, the heck, why, why are we doing this? And so uh, if we, we thought about it, they were getting no first-line treatment in the NICU, and they came up to us, and then we were increasing the first-line treatment, so maybe we could in decrease the second-line treatment more quickly. Think about medication really as a second-line treatment. So we started to just say, okay, instead of doing this slowly over these, let's, let's do it three times a day as tolerated. Uh, if they were doing fine, we could bring it down. And often they would just need a lot less morphine than we're getting downstairs. And we could do this. And we, instead, of, instead of getting off the morphine in eight to 10 days, you could get off in two or three days. So we started doing that. And then we said, well, why are we even doing that? Like, what is it about? Why, why are we going through this wean? And so we said, let's actually just, why don't, what if we think about giving them the morphine like when they need it and not when they don't need it, which is another radical idea. And so I'll give you an example. So. You have a, it's 3 o'clock in the afternoon. The baby is totally inconsolable. We can't, we can't calm the kid down. We, we, we go into the room, and uh, the mom's not there. She went out for a smoke. And so the first line treatment is mom. So we call mom and say, hey, get back in here. And mom comes back, breastfeeds, baby's fine. End of story. Another situation, still 3 o'clock. Mom's there. Uh, mom's not there. She, she went to the methadone clinic. We, are, we can't console the baby. We've tried everything. We can't do it. It's been 10, 15, that's 20, it's 20 minutes. We, we've tried everything. We can't calm the baby down. We try to feed the baby. Everything's calm. We're holding. Can't do it. So we give a dose of morphine. Mom's back at 6 o'clock. Next dose is due. Baby's quiet in her arms, holding, calm, eating, sleeping, consoling. Why would we give another dose of morphine? What's, what would the, what's the medication for at that point? So. We said, let's just give it as we need. Now, if the baby was still, still needed at 6 o'clock, we would give it. And then at 9 o'clock, we would look again. And if the baby still needed it, we would give it, and so on and so forth. But we would only give it when we needed it. And that made a big difference. So we found instead of, instead of buying 80 to 100 doses and, and giving medication being so fraught, and what we had seen, and we're still sort of recovering from this, we were, we were giving all these kids morphine, and a lot of our approach was to say, like, boy, we really don't think we need to be using a lot of morphine. Um, maybe, we, we can, maybe we can do this a little bit differently, and, and sort of we're negative about medication, and because it was so fraught to start these things. There's, there's a, 
I, I was at a, a meeting in, um, in, at Dartmouth, and they would take a lot of pride in how they uh, do their non-pharmacologic care. And they were still using Finnegan scores at the time, and they had a panel of five moms who had all had a really good experience. And they spoke for an hour, and they spoke exclusively about the Finnegan tool and about how they were really nervous because they knew that nurse scored a little bit higher at night, and they knew that, that, that the baby had two scores of eight, and did anyone see that sneeze? And they were so freaked out about it because they knew it was so fraught that if they got that, if somebody saw that extra sneeze, they were here for two more weeks. And the idea with doing it as needed is it doesn't actually increase your length of stay necessarily. So if, you don't, if you're just having a tough period, you can, give, you can give morphine and that can be it. And so it doesn't buy you anything else other than that one dose. And so it should be much easier. And we saw our length of stay down to seven days. And now you can see our three standard deviations is actually below the, the, uh, the Vaughn number. Who went into neonatal medicine because you're excited about addiction? Yeah, right, okay, good, 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 good uh, career decision. The moms felt guilty about, uh, they know that what they were taking, whether it was prescribed or not, is putting their baby through this. They, they are not, they, they're not unaware of that. They feel judged by the nursing staff. And if you look at some of the studies um, that have interviewed nurses going through this, it's what the nurses have said too. Yeah, we're, we're kind of angry at these moms. We feel like they put their kids through this, we're judging them. So that kind of lined up nicely. And then they didn't trust the nurses because they were going through this. And there are a couple of quotes from moms in this study that were really powerful to us. His nurse was like, his muscles are locking up because of his junkie mom. I didn't want to visit. I would call before, and if that nurse was there, I wouldn't even go. So those of you who had babies, imagine not feeling welcome to visit. First of all, the idea of visiting your baby, and then not feeling welcome to do that. Uh, because we're going we're gonna to leave, and he's going to cry, and they're going to leave him crying because they're going to be like, you know what? His parents are jerks. And then this is the last one. This is a long one, but this is, a, this is one that really affected how we manage things. If you're using while you're pregnant, you have a problem, a big problem, and you need help. You obviously don't care about yourself, about anything except the drug. Make it a little bit easier on that mother if she's showing initiative. She's taking the time to be there. If she loves her child, you can see it and you can feel it. If it's obvious that she's there for the baby, then embrace it. Make it easier. You don't know what her circumstances are. You don't know what she's been through or how hard her life has been. You don't know what she was feeling when she was pregnant, if she was being abused, if she was poor. Whatever the reason she was using while she was pregnant, you just don't know. So try to make it easier for her. We realized we were making it harder for these moms. We were making them feel unwelcome. We were excluding them from the care of their baby. So we were really separating them. We were encouraging them to separate from their baby, to not bond. This is not good stuff. And so we said, OK, no, this is not. And we kind of worked up to this. This is what is our role as caregivers in this? And it's no longer, we're not giving medication anymore. We're not even the moms and the family are. It's not, I say moms, but we've had single dads. It's often the whole family who's pitching in with this to, to do all this. Uh, but our role is really as coaches and cheerleaders now. And so that's what we're doing. We're telling them, you can do this. You have everything it takes to care for your baby. Because what are we thinking about with this? We're not, I'm taking care of this baby for, for a few days in the hospital. This is going to be a lifelong thing. How do we set them up for the most success? Is it a situation where at 28 days we're handing the baby off and they haven't bonded? This is a baby is a still irritable stranger to them. They haven't bonded, which we know, we have lots of data on that, how important maternal infant bonding is. Uh, is that the best way to su success, or is a little bit shorter time in the hospital where the mom is doing the work, where they have bonded, where we have coached them and we have supported them so that they are ready to do this? And that they are instead, what we are seeing now is instead of this handoff where they're saying no, we have the mom standing at the door on the fifth day saying, hey, can I go home? I got this. And the answer is, yeah. So there are times where there is no mom. There is no family. No, nobody can be there, or they, there, there's going to be no, no, this baby's going up for adoption. And so that doesn't change what the baby needs. Like, this is hokey, but the treatment for this is essentially love. Somebody needs to love the baby full time. And so if it's not going to be a mom, it's whoever else we can find. And then it takes a village within the hospital. And if it's a medical system, we can't figure out how to do that, then we have to take a step back and see what we're actually doing. So very quickly, the old protocol, the old idea was to suppress the withdrawal signs. That's what you're doing with Finnegan. Here it is to have the infant function as a normal neonate. NICU, mom visits. Mother and child are together. The location doesn't matter as long as they are together. Finnegan scores are treating a number. Eat, sleep, and soul idea. It's really, this isn't a score. This is a concept. It's just treating the infant. You actually have to say, hey, how's the baby doing? Not, what's the score? Uh, everyone does supportive care. We're zealots about it. That is the treatment. 
Uh, feed on demand, uh, we started this at a full head of hair. There's no feeding schedule anymore. If I have to hear that baby's not due to eat one more time, I don't know what happens. Um, morphine was the key to our treatment. Now that shows up on page three of our uh, protocol. Used to be a surprise uh, to families what was gonna happen in the hospital. Now we have meetings with them. They're prepared. We're, we're, we are empowering them from, the, from before birth. And the staff taking care of the infant to the staff's role is to coach the parents in support so that they can so we can have success at home. Uh, our, and this is for the last, uh, our length stays have been about a little under six days for the last four years. Again, not our goal. Our standard, we have had a couple kids stay longer than 10 days, usually with some difficulty eating. Um, and we, uh, the percent of patients that we treated initially was 98%. Uh, the percent that we treat now is 100%, aggressively from birth, just not with medication. Medication is more like around 10%. I think it should probably be a little bit higher. We're still sort of averse to it, and, and, uh, and we're, we're working on that. It's very surreal for me to be pushing medication a lot more. We should be using a lot more PRN doses. Um, Boston Medical Center just did a PRN study where they're giving to about 50% of the kids. That might be a little higher than we would do, but it's probably somewhere between our number and their number is probably, is probably the right number. Uh, but, they're, but when they're giving it, they're giving one or two doses to each kid, and that's it. Uh, average maximum, we, we, we've had two kids in five years we've given more than the starting dose to, and we've just gone up. People have asked, well, how do you escalate? And the answer is that we don't really know. We just sort of do something the two times it's happened. Uh, breastfeeding rates went from nothing to above 50%. Uh, average cost of care was, is down by 75%. Uh, Boston Medical Center started doing this. They developed uh, a scoring tool. You'll see a scoring tool, which I think is entirely unnecessary uh, and almost comical, because this is secretly, if you don't tell anyone, the eat, sleep, console stuff is how we evaluate all babies. Um, and so just, we don't have a scoring tool for them. I think we don't, don't really need it. Um, they, what they did with their initial studies, they, their, their numbers went from treatment went from 82% to 40%. Length of stay from 18 days to 10 days. They had no readmissions. They weren't satisfied with this. They actually, last year they came down to visit with us. They spent the day with us to see see what we were doing um, and and talk to our nursing staff and see how we we're managing these babies. And their length of stay has gone down since then. Um, we've seen this spread to a lot 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 of the country. The most interesting one for me, we think about how to do this. There's been a lot of places that have have done this stuff. The the one place that was. Uh, most interesting is Middlesex Hospital, which is actually that hospital that I had to go give that talk to uh, the, when I had to read all the stuff. And uh, they, their length of stay, they came, this is about three years ago now, their length of stay was a, still about 28 days. And they drove down uh, the 45 minutes to meet with us. They spent the afternoon, we met a patient, I went through all of our stuff and our approach. And what I've seen for a lot of places that have tried to implement this is they say, okay, in 2022, we're gonna try this small change and then at the end of 2022, we'll try this other thing. What these guys did is on the drive back, the 45 minute drive, they totally changed their protocol in the car on the way back. They said, we are not treating a baby and a mom the way we've been doing it for one more day. And they started that night. One of the people with, who was in the car was the nurse practitioner who was gonna be on that night. And they have not had a kid stay longer than 10 days since then. And so when you talk about implementation, they just said, nope, this is a must and this starts now. And there was a, the first month, as you can imagine, was a little bit rough, and then it was totally fine. And then uh, that just became how they did it again. It became ha this is how we do things here. The first month, the nurses were upset, and they said, nope, this makes sense. And that's how, that's how it went. And so the, the idea is it's hugs before drugs, it's empowering families, it's rooming in. That was my more pleasant second kid. Non-pharmacologic care, eat, sleep, PR and meds, and ask why. If you're going to do the Finnegan tool, decide to do it. Say, no, this makes the most sense because of these reasons. We're going to use a score of eight because of these reasons. Everyone, when I ask that question for you and Finnegan about who, who, who was in the room to decide it, you guys should all be raising your hands if you're going to keep doing it. And, it. and the three key elements to this, it's not a tool, it's not the approach is mom is the medicine, pretend it's a baby, and treat the mom like a mom. And that's it. Do those three things and you take the boxes away, and when you say, anytime you say you can't do those things, if you can't keep a mom and baby together, that's a problem. So that's, think about, think about all the stuff at the border with family separation. Let's just make sure we're not doing that. Okay? All right. Thank you, everybody. A lot of, this is a whole team effort, but thank you.